The Blue Cross by G. K. Chesterton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London. The Blue Cross by G. K. Chesterton. Between the silver ribbon of morning and the green glittering ribbon of sea, the boat touched Harwich and let loose a swarm of folks like flies, among whom the man we must follow was by no means conspicuous, nor wished to be. There was nothing notable about him except a slight contrast between the holiday gaiety of his clothes and the official gravity of his face. His clothes included a slight pale grey jacket, a white waistcoat, and a silver straw hat with a grey-blue ribbon. His lean face was dark by contrast, and ended in a curt black beard that looked Spanish and suggested an Elizabethan ruff. He was smoking a cigarette with the seriousness of an idler. There was nothing about him to indicate the fact that the grey jacket covered a loaded revolver, that the white waistcoat covered a police card, or that the straw hat covered one of the most powerful intellects in Europe. For this was Valentin himself, the head of the Paris police and the most famous investigator of the world, and he was coming from Brussels to London to make the greatest arrest of the century. Flambeau was in England. The police of three countries had tracked the great criminal at last from Ghent to Brussels, from Brussels to the Hook of Holland, and it was conjectured that he would take some advantage of the unfamiliarity and confusion of the Eucharist Congress then taking place in London. Probably he would travel as some minor clerk or secretary connected with it, but of course Valentin could not be certain. Nobody could be certain about Flambeau. It is many years now since this colossus of crime suddenly ceased keeping the world in a turmoil, and when he ceased, as they said after the death of Roland, there was a great quiet upon the earth. But in his best days, I mean, of course, his worst, Flambeau was a figure as statuesque and international as the Kaiser. Almost every morning the daily papers announced that he'd escaped the consequences of one extraordinary crime by committing another. He was a Gascon of gigantic stature and bodily daring, and the wildest tales were told of his outbursts of athletic humour, how he turned the judge to instruction upside down and stood him on his head to clear his mind, how he ran down the Rue de Rivoli with a policeman under each arm. It is due to him to say that his fantastic physical strength was generally employed in such bloodless though undignified scenes. His real crimes were chiefly those of ingenuous and wholesale robbery. But each of his thefts was almost a new sin, and would make a story by itself. It was him who ran the great Tyrolean Dairy Company in London, with no dairies, no cows, no carts, no milk, but with some thousand subscribers. These he served by the simple operation of moving the little milk cans outside people's doors, to the doors of his own customers. It was he who had kept up an unaccountable and close correspondence with a young lady whose whole letter-bag was intercepted by the extraordinary trick of photographing his messages infinitesimally small upon the slides of a microscope. A sweeping simplicity, however, marked many of his experiments. It is said that he once repainted all the numbers in a street in the dead of night merely to divert one traveller into a trap. It is quite certain that he invented a portable pillar-box which he put up at corners in quiet suburbs on the chance of strangers dropping postal orders into it. Lastly, he was known to be a startling acrobat. Despite his huge figure, he could leap like a grasshopper and melt into the treetops like a monkey. Hence the great Valentin when he set out to find Flambeau, was perfectly aware that his adventures would not end when he had found him. But how was he to find him? On this the great Valentin's ideas were still in process of settlement. There was one thing which Flambeau, with all his dexterity of disguise, could not cover, and that was his singular height. 
if valentine's quick eye had caught a tall apple woman a tall grenadier or even a tolerably tall duchess he might have arrested them on the spot but all along his train there was nobody that could be a disguised flambeau any more than a cat could be a disguised giraffe about the people on the boat he had already satisfied himself and the people picked up at harwich or on the journey limited themselves with certainty to six there was a short railway official travelling up to the terminus three fairly short market gardeners picked up two stations afterwards one very short widow lady going up from a small essex town and a very short roman catholic priest going up from a small essex village when it came to the last case valentin gave it up and almost laughed the little priest was so much the essence of those eastern flats he had a face as round and dull as a norfolk dumpling he had eyes as empty as the north sea he had several brown paper parcels which he was quite incapable of collecting the eucharist congress had doubtless sucked out of their local stagnation many such creatures blind and helpless like moles disinterred valentin was a sceptic in the severe style of france and could have no love for priests but he could have pity for them and this one might have provoked pity in anybody he had a large shabby umbrella which constantly fell on the floor he did not seem to know which was the right end of his return ticket he explained with a moon calf simplicity to everybody in the carriage that he had to be careful because he had something made of real silver with blue stones in one of the brown paper parcels his quaint blending of essex flatness with saintly simplicity continuously amused the frenchman till the priest arrived somehow at tottenham with all his parcels and came back for his umbrella when he did the last valentin even had the good nature to warn him not to take care of the silver by telling everybody about it but to whomever he talked valentin kept his eye open for someone else he looked out steadily for anyone rich or poor male or female who was well up to six feet for flambeau was four inches above it he alighted at liverpool street however quite conscientiously secure that he had not missed the criminal so far he then went to scotland yard to regularize his position and arrange for help in case of need he then lit another cigarette and went for a long stroll in the streets of london as he was walking in the streets and squares beyond victoria he paused suddenly and stood it was a quaint quiet square very typical of london full of an accidental stillness the tall flat houses round looked at once prosperous and uninhabited the square of shrubbery in the centre looked as deserted as a green pacific islet one of the four sides was much higher than the rest like a dais and the line of this side was broken by one of london's admirable accidents a restaurant that looked as if it had strayed from soho it was an unreasonably attractive object with dwarf plants in pots and long striped blinds of lemon yellow and white it stood specially high above the street and in the usual patchwork way of london a flight of steps from the street ran up to meet the front door almost as a fire escape might run up to a first-floor window valentin stood and smoked in front of the yellow-white blinds and considered them long the most incredible thing about miracles is that they happen a few clouds in heaven do come together into the staring shape of one human eye a tree does stand up in the landscape of a doubtful journey in the exact and elaborate shape of a note of interrogation i have seen both these things myself within the last few days nelson does die in the instant of victory and a man named williams does quite accidentally murder a man named williamson it sounds like a sort of infanticide in short there is in life the element of elfin coincidence which people reckoning on the prosaic may perpetually miss as it has been well expressed in the paradox of poe wisdom should reckon on the unforeseen aristide valentin was unfathomably french and the french intelligence is intelligence specially and solely he was not a thinking machine for that is a brainless phrase of modern fatalism and materialism
A machine only is a machine because it cannot think. But he was a thinking man and a plain man at the same time. All his wonderful successes that looked like conjuring had been gained by plodding logic, by clear and commonplace French thought. The French electrify the world not by starting any paradox, they electrify it by carrying out a truism. They carry a truism so far as in the French Revolution. But exactly because Valentin understood reason, he understood the limits of reason. Only a man who knows nothing of motors talks of motoring without petrol. Only a man who knows nothing of reason talks of reasoning without strong, undisputed first principles. Here he had no strong first principles. Flambeau had been missed at Harwich, and if he was in London at all, he might be anything from a tall tramp on Wimbledon Common to a tall toastmaster at the Hotel Metropole. In such a naked state of nescience, Valentin had a view and a method of his own. In such cases he reckoned on the unforeseen. In such cases, when he could not follow the train of the reasonable, he coldly and carefully followed the train of the unreasonable. Instead of going to the right places, banks, police stations, rendezvous, he systematically went to the wrong places, knocked at every empty house, turned down every cul-de-sac, went up every lane blocked with rubbish, went round every crescent that led him uselessly out of the way. He defended this crazy course quite logically. He said that if one had a clue, this was the worst way. But if one had no clue at all, it was the best, because there was just the chance that any oddity that caught the eye of the pursuer might be the same that had caught the eye of the pursued. Somewhere a man must begin, and it had better be just where another man might stop. Something about that flight of steps up to the shop Something about the quietude and the quaintness of the restaurant roused all the detective's rare romantic fancy and made him resolve to strike at random. He went up the steps and, sitting down at a table by the window, asked for a cup of black coffee. It was halfway through the morning and he had not breakfasted. The slight litter of other breakfasts stood about on the table to remind him of his hunger and adding a poached egg to his order, he proceeded musingly to shake some white sugar into his coffee, thinking all the time about Flambeau. He remembered how Flambeau had escaped, once by a pair of nail scissors, and once by a house on fire, once by having to pay for an unstamped letter, and once by getting people to look through a telescope at a comet that might destroy the world. He thought his detective brain as good as the criminal's, which was true, but he fully realised the disadvantage. The criminal is the creative artist, the detective only the critic, he said with a sour smile, and lifted his coffee cup to his lips slowly, and put it down very quickly. He had put salt in it. He looked at the vessel from which the silvery powder had come, it was certainly a sugar basin, as unmistakably meant for sugar as a champagne bottle for champagne. He wondered why they should keep salt in it. He looked to see if there were any more orthodox vessels. Yes, there were two salt cellars quite full. Perhaps there was some speciality in the condiment in the salt cellars. He tasted it. It was sugar. Then he looked round at the restaurant with a refreshed air of interest to see if there was any other traces of that singular artistic taste which puts the sugar in the salt cellars and the salt in the sugar basin. Except for an odd splash of some dark fluid on one of the white-papered walls, the whole place appeared neat, cheerful and ordinary. He rang the bell for the waiter. When that official hurried up, fuzzy-haired and somewhat blear-eyed at that early hour, the detective, who was not without an appreciation of the simpler forms of humour, asked him to taste the sugar and see if it was up to the high reputation of the hotel. The result was that the waiter yawned suddenly and woke up. 
Do you play this delicate joke on your customers every morning? inquired Valentin. Does changing the salt and sugar never pall on you as a jest? The waiter, when this irony grew clearer, stammeringly assured him that the establishment had certainly no such intention. It must be a most curious mistake. He picked up the sugar basin and looked at it. He picked up the salt cellar and looked at that, his face growing more and more bewildered. At last he abruptly excused himself and, hurrying away, returned in a few seconds with the proprietor. The proprietor also examined the sugar basin and then the salt cellar. The proprietor also looked bewildered. Suddenly the waiter seemed to grow inarticulate with a rush of words. I zink, he stuttered easily, I zink it is those two clergymen. What two clergymen? The two clergymen, said the waiter, that threw soup at the wall. Threw soup at the wall, repeated Valentin, feeling sure this must be some singular Italian metaphor. Yes, yes, said the attendant excitedly, and pointed at the dark splash on the white paper. Threw it over there on the wall. Valentin looked his query at the proprietor, who came to his rescue with fuller reports. Yes, sir, he said, it is quite true, though I don't suppose it has anything to do with the sugar and salt. Two clergymen came in and drank soup here very early, as soon as the shutters were taken down. They were both very quiet, respectable people. One of them paid the bill and went out. The other, who seemed a slower coach altogether, was some minutes longer getting his things together. But he went at last. Only the instant before he stepped into the street, he deliberately picked up his cup, which he had only half emptied, and threw the soup slap on the wall. I was in the back room myself, and so was the waiter, so I could only rush out in time to find the wall splashed and the shop empty. It don't do any particular damage, but it was confounded cheek, and I tried to catch the men in the street. They were too far off, though. I only noticed they went round the next corner into Carstairs Street. The detective was on his feet, hat settled and stick in hand. He had already decided that, in the universal darkness of his mind, he could only follow the first odd finger that pointed, and this finger was odd enough. Paying his bill and clashing the glass doors behind him, he was soon swinging round into the other street. It was fortunate that even in such fevered moments his eye was cool and quick. Something in a shop front went by him like a mere flash, yet he went back to look at it. The shop was a popular greengrocer and fruiterer's, an array of goods set out in the open air and plainly ticketed with their names and prices. In the two most prominent compartments were two heaps of oranges and nuts, respectively. On the heap of nuts lay a scrap of cardboard on which was written in bold blue chalk. Best tangerine oranges, two a penny. On the oranges was the equally clear and exact description. Finest Brazil nuts, fourpence a pound. M. Valentin looked at these two placards and fancied he had met this highly subtle form of humour before, and that somewhat recently. He drew the attention of the red-faced fruitier, who was looking rather sullenly up and down the street, to this inaccuracy in his advertisements. The fruiterer said nothing but sharply put each card into its proper place. The detective, leaning elegantly on his walking cane, continued to scrutinise the shop. At last, he said, "'Pray excuse my apparent irrelevance, my good sir, "'but I should like to ask you a question "'in experimental psychology and the association of ideas.' "'The red-faced shopman regarded him with an eye of menace, "'but he continued gaily, swinging his cane. "'Why,' he pursued, "'why are two tickets wrongly placed in a greengrocer's shop "'like a shovel hat?' that has come to London for a holiday. Or, in case I do not make myself clear, what is the mystical association which connects the idea of nuts, marked as oranges, with the idea of two clergymen, one tall and the other short? The eyes of the tradesman stood out of his head like a snail's. He really seemed for an instant likely to fling himself upon the stranger. At last he stammered angrily, I don't know what you have to do with it, but if you're one of their friends, you can tell him from me that I'll knock their silly heads off 
parsons or no parsons if they upset my apples again indeed asked the detective with great sympathy did they upset your apples one of em did said the heated shopman rolled em all over the street i'd have caught the fool but for having to pick them up which way did these parsons go asked valentin up the second road on the left hand side and then across the square said the other promptly thanks replied valentin and vanished like a fairy on the other side of the second square he found a policeman and said this is urgent constable have you seen two clergymen in shovel hats the policeman began to chuckle heavily i have sir and if you asked me one of him was drunk he stood in the middle of the road that bewildered that which way did they go snapped valentin they took one of them yellow buses over there answered the man them that go to Hampstead. valentin produced his official card and said very rapidly call up two of your men to come with me in pursuit and crossed the road with such contagious energy that the ponderous policeman was moved to almost agile obedience in a minute and a half the french detective was joined on the opposite pavement by an inspector and a man in plain clothes well sir began the former with smiling importance and what may valentin pointed suddenly with his cane i'll tell you on the top of that omnibus he said and was darting and dodging across the tangle of the traffic when all three sank panting on the top seats of the yellow vehicle the inspector said we could go four times as quick in a taxi quite true replied their leader placidly if we only had an idea of where we were going well where are you going asked the other staring valentin smoked frowningly for a few seconds then removing his cigarette he said if you know what a man's doing get in front of him but if you want to guess what he's doing keep behind him stray when he strays stop when he stops travel as slowly as he then you may see what he saw and may act as he acted all we can do is to keep our eyes skinned for a queer thing what sort of queer thing do you mean asked the inspector any sort of queer thing answered valentin and relapsed into obstinate silence the yellow omnibus crawled up the northern roads for what seemed like hours on end the great detective would not explain further, and perhaps his assistants felt a silent and growing doubt of his errand. Perhaps also they felt a silent and growing desire for lunch, for the hours crept long past the normal luncheon hour, and the long roads of the north London suburbs seemed to shoot out into length after length like an infernal telescope. It was one of those journeys on which a man perpetually feels that now at last he must have come to the end of the universe, and then finds he has only come to the beginning of Tufnell Park. London died away in draggled taverns and dreary scrubs, and then was unaccountably born again in blazing high streets and blatant hotels. It was like passing through thirteen separate vulgar cities, all just touching each other, but though the winter twilight was already threatening the road ahead of them, the Parisian detective still sat silent and watchful, eyeing the frontage of the streets that slid by on either side. By the time they had left Camden Town behind, the policemen were nearly asleep. At least they gave something like a jump as Valentin leapt erect, struck a hand on each man's shoulder, and shouted to the driver to stop. They tumbled down the steps into the road without realising why they had been dislodged. When they looked round for enlightenment, they found Valentin triumphantly pointing his finger towards a window on the left side of the road. It was a large window forming part of the long façade of a gilt and palatial public house. It was the part reserved for respectable dining and labelled restaurant. This window, like all the rest along the frontage of the hotel, was of frosted and figured glass, but in the middle of it was a big black smash, like a star in the ice. Our cue at last, cried Valentin, waving his stick. The place with the broken window. What window? What cue? asked his principal assistant. Why, what proof is there that this has anything to do with them? Valentin almost broke his bamboo stick with rage. Proof, he cried. Good God, 
The man is looking for proof. Why, of course, the chances are twenty to one that it has nothing to do with them. But what else can we do? Don't you see we must either follow one wild possibility or else go home to bed? He banged his way into the restaurant, followed by his companions, and they were soon seated at a late luncheon at a little table and looked at the star of smashed glass from the inside. Not that it was very informative to them, even then. "'Got your window broken, I see,' said Valentin to the waiter as he paid the bill. "'Yes, sir,' answered the attendant, bending busily over the change, to which Valentin silently added an enormous tip. The waiter straightened himself with mild but unmistakable animation. "'Ah, yes, sir,' he said. "'Very odd thing, that, sir.' "'Indeed. Tell us about it,' said the detective with careless curiosity. "'Well, two gents in black came in,' said the waiter. Two of those foreign parsons that are running about.' "'They had a cheap and quiet little lunch, and one of them paid for it and went out.' The other was just going out to join him when I looked at my change again, and I found he'd paid me more than three times too much. Here, I says to the chap who was nearly out of the door, you've paid too much. Oh, he says, very cool. Have we? Yes, I says, and picks up the bill to show him. Well, that was a knockout. What do you mean, asks his interlocutor? "'Well, I'd have sworn on seven Bibles that i put four shillings on that bill, "'but now I saw I'd put fourteen shillings, as plain as paint.' "'Well,' cried Valentin, moving slowly, but with burning eyes, "'and then, the parson at the door, he says all serene, "'sorry to confuse your account, but I'll pay for the window.' "'What window?' I says. "'One I'm going to break,' he says, "'and smash the blessed pane with his umbrella.' "'All three inquirers made an exclamation, "'and the inspector said under his breath, "'Are we after escaped lunatics?' "'The waiter went on with some relish for the ridiculous story. "'I was so knocked silly for a second I couldn't do anything. "'The man marched out of the place "'and joined his friend just round the corner. "'Then they went so quick up Bullock Street "'that I couldn't catch them, "'though I went round the bars to do it. "'Bullock Street,' said the detective, "'and shot up that thoroughfare "'as quickly as the strange couple he pursued. "'Their journey now took them through bare brick ways "'like tunnels, streets with few lights "'and even with few windows, "'streets that seemed built out of the blank backs of everything and everywhere. Dusk was deepening, and it was not easy even for the London policeman to guess in what exact direction they were treading. The inspector, however, was pretty certain that they would eventually strike some part of Hampstead Heath. Abruptly, one bulging gaslit window broke the blue twilight like a bull's-eye lantern, and Valentin stopped an instant before a little garish sweetstuff shop. After an instant's hesitation, he went in. He stood amid the gaudy colours of the confectionery with entire gravity and bought thirteen chocolate cigars with a certain care. He was clearly preparing an opening, but he did not need one. An angular elderly young woman in the shop had regarded his elegant appearance with a merely automatic inquiry, but when she saw the door behind him blocked with the blue uniform of the inspector, her eyes seemed to wake up. Oh, she said, if you've come about that parcel, I've sent it off already. Parcel, repeated Valentin, and it was his turn to look inquiring. I mean the parcel the gentleman left, the clergyman gentleman. For goodness sake, said Valentin, leaning forward with his first real confession of eagerness, for heaven's sake, tell us what happened exactly. Well, said the woman a little doubtfully, the clergyman came in about half an hour ago and bought some peppermints and talked a bit and then went off towards the heath. But a second after, one of them runs back into the shop and says, Have I left a parcel? Well, I looked everywhere and couldn't see one, so he says, Never mind, but if it should turn up, please post it to this address. And he left me the address and a shilling for my trouble. And sure enough, Though I thought I'd looked everywhere, I found he'd left a brown paper parcel. So I posted it to the place he said. I can't remember the address now. It was somewhere in Westminster. But as the thing seemed so important, I thought perhaps the police had come about it. 
"'So they have,' said Valentin shortly. "'Is Hampstead Heath near here?' "'Straight on for fifteen minutes,' said the woman, "'and you'll come right out on the open.' Valentin sprang out of the shop and began to run. The other detectives followed him at a reluctant trot. The street they threaded was so narrow and shut in by shadows that when they came out unexpectedly into the void common and vast sky, they were startled to find the evening still so light and clear. A perfect dome of peacock green sang into the gold amid the blackening trees and the dark violet distances. The glowing green tint was just deep enough to pick out, in points of crystal, one or two stars. All that was left of the daylight lay in a golden glitter across the edge of Hampstead, and that popular hollow which is called the Vale of Health. The holiday-makers who roamed this region had not wholly dispersed. A few couples sat shapelessly on benches, and here and there a distant girl still shrieked in one of the swings. The glory of heaven deepened and darkened around the sublime vulgarity of man, and standing on the slope and looking across the valley, Valentin beheld the thing which he sought. Among the black and breaking groups in that distance was one specially black which did not break, a group of two figures clerically clad. Though they seemed as small as insects, Valentin could see that one of them was much smaller than the other. Though the other had a student stoop and an inconspicuous manner, he could see that the man was well over six feet high. He shut his teeth and went forward, whirling his stick impatiently. By the time he had substantially diminished the distance and magnified the two black figures, as in a vast microscope, he had perceived something else, something which startled him, and yet which he had somehow expected. Whoever was the tall priest, there could be no doubt about the identity of the short one, it was his friend of the Harwich train, the stumpy little cure of Essex whom he had warned about his brown paper parcels. Now, so far as this went, everything fitted in finally and rationally enough. Valentin had learned by his inquiries that morning that a father brown from Essex was bringing up a silver cross with sapphires, a relic of considerable value, to show some of the foreign priests at the Congress. This undoubtedly was the silver with blue stones, and Father Brown undoubtedly was the little greenhorn in the train. Now there was nothing wonderful about the fact that what Valentin had found out Flambeau had also found out. Flambeau found out everything. Also there was nothing wonderful in the fact that when Flambeau heard of a sapphire cross, he should try to steal it. That was the most natural thing in all natural history, and most certainly there was nothing wonderful about the fact that Flambeau should have it all his own way with such a silly sheep as the man with the umbrella and the parcels. He was the sort of man whom anybody could lead on a string to the North Pole. It was not surprising that an actor like Flambeau, dressed as another priest, could lead him to Hampstead Heath. So far the crime seemed clear enough, and while the detective pitied the priest for his helplessness, he almost despised Flambeau for condescending to so gullible a victim. But when Valentin thought of all that had happened in between, of all that had led him to his triumph, he racked his brains for the smallest rhyme or reason in it. What had the stealing of a blue and silver cross from a priest from Essex to do with chucking soup at wallpaper, what had it to do with calling nuts oranges or paying for windows first and breaking them afterwards? He had come to the end of his chase, yet somehow he had missed the middle of it. When he failed, which was seldom, he had usually grasped the clue, but nevertheless missed the criminal. Here he had grasped the criminal, but still he could not grasp the clue. The two figures that they followed were crawling like black flies, across the huge green contour of a hill. They were evidently sunk in conversation and perhaps did not notice where they were going, but they were certainly going to the wilder and more silent heights of the heath. As their pursuers gained on them, the latter had to use the undignified attitudes of the deer-stalker, to crouch behind clumps of trees and even to crawl prostrate in deep grass. By these ungainly ingenuities the hunters even came close enough to the quarry to hear the murmur of the discussion, but no word could be distinguished except the word reason, 
recurring frequently in a high and almost childish voice. Once over an abrupt dip of land and a dense tangle of thickets, the detectives actually lost the two figures they were following. They did not find the trail again for an agonizing ten minutes, and then it led round the brow of a great dome of hill overlooking the amphitheatre of rich and desolate sunset scenery. Under a tree in this commanding yet neglected spot was an old ramshackle wooden seat. On this seat sat the two priests, still in serious speech together. The gorgeous green and gold still clung to the darkening horizon, but the dome above was turning slowly from peacock green to peacock blue, and the stars detached themselves more and more like solid jewels. Mutely motioning to his followers, Valentin contrived to creep up behind the big branching tree, and, standing there in deathly silence, heard the words of the strange priest for the first time. After he had listened for a minute and a half, he was gripped by a devilish doubt. Perhaps he had dragged the two English policemen to the wastes of a nocturnal heath on an errand no saner than seeking figs on its thistles. For the two priests were talking exactly like priests, piously, with learning and leisure, about the most aerial enigmas of theology. The little Essex priest spoke the more simply, with his round face turned to the strengthening stars. The other talked with his head bowed, as if he were not even worthy to look at them. But no more innocently clerical conversation could have been heard in any white Italian cloister or black Spanish cathedral. The first he heard was the tale of one of Father Brown's sentences, which ended what they really meant in the Middle Ages by the heavens being incorruptible. The taller priest nodded his bowed head and said, Ah, yes, these modern infidels appeal to their reason, but who can look at those millions of worlds and not feel that there may well be wonderful universes above us where reason is utterly unreasonable? No, said the other priest, reason is always reasonable, even in the last limbo, in the lost borderland of things. I know that people charge the church with lowering reason, but it is just the other way. Alone on earth the church makes reason really supreme. Alone on earth the church affirms that God himself is bound by reason. The other priest raised his austere face to the spangled sky and said, Yet who knows if in that infinite universe, only infinite physically, said the little priest, turning sharply in his seat, not infinite in the sense of escaping from the laws of truth, Valentin behind his tree was tearing his fingernails with silent fury. He seemed almost to hear the sniggers of the English detectives, whom he had brought so far on a fantastic guess, only to listen to the metaphysical gossip of two mild old parsons. In his impatience he lost the equally elaborate answer of the tall cleric, and when he listened again it was again Father Brown who was speaking. Reason and justice grip the remotest and the loneliest star. Look at those stars. Don't they look as if they were single diamonds and sapphires? Well, you can imagine any mad botany or geology you please. Think of forests of adamant with leaves of brilliance. Think the moon is a blue moon, a single elephantine sapphire. But don't fancy that all that frantic astronomy would make the smallest difference to the reason and justice of conduct. On plains of opal, under cliffs cut out of pearl, you would still find a notice-board, Thou shalt not steal. Valentin was just in the act of rising from his rigid and crouching attitude, and creeping away as softly as might be, fell by the one great folly of his life. But something in the very silence of the tall priest made him stop, until the latter spoke. When, at last, he did speak, he said simply, his head bowed and his hands on his knees, Well, I think that other worlds may perhaps rise higher than our reason. The mystery of heaven is unfathomable, and I for one can only bow my head. Then, with brow yet bent and without changing by the faintest shade his attitude or voice, he added, just hand over that sapphire cross of yours, will you? We're all alone here, and I could pull you to pieces like a straw doll. 
The utterly unaltered voice and attitude added a strange violence to that shocking change of speech. But the guarder of the relic only seemed to turn his head by the smallest section of the compass. He seemed still to have a somewhat foolish face turned to the stars. Perhaps he had not understood, or perhaps he had understood and sat rigid with terror. Yes, said the tall priest, in the same low voice and in the same still posture. Yes, I am Flambeau. Then, after a pause, he said, Come, will you give me that cross? No, said the other, and the monosyllable had an odd sound. Flambeau suddenly flung off all his pontifical pretensions. The great robber leaned back in his seat and laughed low but long. No, he cried, you won't give it to me, you proud prelate. You won't give it to me, you little celibate simpleton. Shall I tell you why you won't give it to me? Because I've got it already in my own breast pocket. The small man from Essex turned what seemed to be a dazed face in the dusk and said, with the timid eagerness of the private secretary, Ah, are you sure? Flambeau yelled with delight. Really, you're as good as a three-act farce, he cried. Yes, you turnip, I am quite sure. I had the sense to make a duplicate of the right parcel, and now, my friend, you've got the duplicate and I've got the jewels. An old dodge, Father Brown, a very old dodge. Yes, said Father Brown, and passed his hand through his hair with the same strange vagueness of manner. Yes, I've heard of it before. The Colossus of Crime leaned over to the little rustic priest with a sort of sudden interest. You have heard of it? he asked. Where have you heard of it? Well, I mustn't tell you his name, of course, said the little man simply. He was a penitent, you know. He had lived prosperously for about twenty years entirely on duplicate brown paper parcels. And so, you see, when I began to suspect you, I thought of this poor chap's way of doing it at once. Began to suspect me? repeated the outlaw with increased intensity. Did you really have the gumption to suspect me just because I brought you up to this bare part of the heath? No, no, said Brown with an air of apology. You see, I suspected you when we first met. It's that little bulge up the sleep where you people have the spiked bracelet. How in Tartarus, cried Flambeau, did you ever hear of the spiked bracelet? Oh, one's little flock, you know, said Father Brown, arching his eyebrows rather blankly. When I was a curate in Hartlepool, there were three of them with spiked bracelets. So, as I suspected you from the first, don't you see, I made sure that the cross should go safe, anyhow. I'm afraid I watched you, you know, so at last I saw you change the parcels. Then, don't you see, I changed them back again, and then I left the right one behind. Left it behind, repeated Flambeau, and for the first time there was another note in his voice beside his triumph. Well, it was like this, said the little priest, speaking in the same unaffected way. I went back to that sweet shop and asked if I'd left a parcel, and gave them a particular address if it turned up. Well, I knew I hadn't, but when I went away again, I did. So instead of running after me with that valuable parcel, they have sent it flying to a friend of mine in Westminster. Then he added rather sadly, I learnt that too from a poor fellow in Hartlepool. He used to do it with handbags he stole at railway stations, but he's in a monastery now. Oh, one gets to know, you know, he added, rubbing his head again with the same sort of desperate apology. We can't help being priests. People come and tell us these things. Flambeau tore a brown paper parcel out of his inner pocket and rent it to pieces. There was nothing but paper and sticks of lead inside it. He sprang to his feet with a gigantic gesture and cried, I don't believe you. I don't believe a bumpkin like you could manage all that. I believe you still got the stuff on you. And if, it, uh, and if you don't give it up, why, we're all alone and I'll take it by force. No, said Father Brown simply and stood up also. You won't take it by force. First, because I really haven't still got it, and second, because we are not alone. Flambeau stopped in his stride forward. Behind that tree, said Father Brown, pointing, 
are two strong policemen and the greatest detective alive. How did they come here, do you ask? Why, I brought them, of course. How did I do it? Why, I'll tell you if you like. Lord bless you, we have to know twenty such things when we work among the criminal classes. Well, I wasn't sure you were a thief, and it would never do to make a scandal against one of our own clergy, so I just tested you to see if anything would make you show yourself. A man generally makes a small scene if he finds salt in his coffee. If he doesn't, he has some reason for keeping quiet. I changed the salt and sugar, and you kept quiet. A man generally objects if his bill is three times too big. If he pays it, he has some motive for passing unnoticed. I altered your bill, and you paid it. The world seemed waiting for Flambeau to leap like a tiger, but he was held back as by a spell. He was stunned with the utmost curiosity. Well, went on Father Brown with a lumbering lucidity, as you wouldn't leave any tracks for the police, of course somebody had to. At every place we went to, I took care to do something that would get us talked about for the rest of the day. I didn't do much harm, a splashed wall, spilt apples, a broken window, but I saved the cross, as the cross will always be saved. It is at Westminster by now. I rather wonder you didn't stop it with the donkey's whistle. With the what? asked Flambeau. I'm glad you've never heard of it, said the priest, making a face. It's a foul thing. I'm sure you're too good a man for a whistler. I couldn't have counted it even with the spots myself. I'm not strong enough in the legs. What on earth are you talking about? asked the other. Well, I did think you'd know the spots, said Father Brown, agreeably surprised. Oh, you can't have gone so very wrong yet. How in blazes do you know all these horrors? cried Flambeau. The shadow of a smile crossed the round, simple face of his clerical opponent. Oh, by being a celibate simpleton, I suppose, he said. Has it never struck you that a man who does next to nothing, but hears men's real sins, is not likely to be wholly unaware of human evil? But, as a matter of fact, another part of my trade, too, made me sure you weren't a priest. What? asked the thief, almost gaping. You attacked reason, said Father Brown. It's bad theology. And even as he turned away to collect his property, the three policemen came out from under the twilight trees. Flambeau was an artist and a sportsman. He stepped back and swept Valentin a great bow. Do not bow to me, mon ami, said Valentin with silver clearness. Let us both bow to our master. And they both stood an instant uncovered while the little Essex priest blinked about for his umbrella. End of the Blue Cross by G. K. Chesterton Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London The Father by Bjorn Stanna Bjornsson this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. The man whose story is here to be told was the wealthiest and most influential person in his parish. His name was Tord Overas. He appeared in the priest's study one day, tall and earnest. I have gotten a son, said he and I wish to present him for baptism. What shall his name be? Finn, after my father. And the sponsors? They were mentioned, and proved to be the best men and women of Tord's relations in the parish. Is there anything else? inquired the priest, and looked up. The peasant hesitated a little. I should like very much to have him baptized by himself, he said finally. That is to say, on a weekday? next saturday at twelve o'clock noon is there anything else inquired the priest there is nothing else and the peasant twirled his cap as though he were about to go then the priest rose there is yet this however said he and walking towards toward he took him by the hand and looked gravely into his eyes god grant that the child may become a blessing to you one day, sixteen years later, Tord stood once more in the priest's study. 
really you carry your age astonishingly well toward said the priest for he saw no change whatever in the man that is because i have no troubles replied toward to this the priest said nothing but after a while he asked what is your pleasure this evening i have come this evening about that son of mine who is to be confirmed to-morrow he is a bright boy i did not wish to pay the priest until i heard what number the boy would have when he takes his place in the church to-morrow he will stand number one so i have heard and here are ten dollars for the priest is there anything else i can do for you inquired the priest fixing his eyes on toward there is nothing else toward went out eight years more rolled by and then one day a noise was heard outside of the priest's study for many men were approaching and at their head was toward who entered first the priest looked up and recognized him you come well attended this evening toward said he i am here to request that the bans may be published for my son he is about to marry karen storlidden daughter of goodman who stands here beside me why that is the richest girl in the parish so they say replied the peasant stroking back his hair with one hand the priest sat a while as if in deep thought then entered the names in his book without making any comments and the men wrote their signatures underneath toward laid three dollars on the table one is all i am to have said the priest i know that very well but he is my only child i want to do it handsomely the priest took the money this is now the third time toward that you have come here on your son's account but now i am through with him said toward and folding up his pocket-book he said farewell and walked away the men slowly followed him a fortnight later the father and son were rowing across the lake one calm still day to store Lydon to make arrangements for the wedding this thwart is not secure said the son and stood up to straighten the seat on which he was sitting at the same moment the board he was standing on slipped from under him he threw out his arms and uttered a shriek and fell overboard take hold of the oar shouted the father springing to his feet and holding out the oar but when the son had made a couple of efforts he grew stiff wait a moment cried the father and began to row toward his son then the son rolled over on his back gave his father one long look and sank toward could scarcely believe it he held the boat still and stared at the spot where his son had gone down as though he must surely come to the surface again there rose some bubbles then some more and finally one large one that burst and the lake lay there as smooth and bright as a mirror again for three days and three nights people saw the father rowing round and round the spot without taking either food or sleep he was dragging the lake for the body of his son and toward morning of the third day he found it and carried it in his arms up over the hills to his guard it might have been about a year from that day when the priest late one autumn evening heard someone in the passage outside of the door carefully trying to find the latch the priest opened the door and in walked a tall thin man with bowed form and white hair the priest looked long at him before he recognized him it was toward are you out walking so late said the priest and stood still in front of him ah yes it is late said toward and took a seat the priest sat down also as though waiting a long long silence followed at last toward said i have something with me that i should like to give to the poor i want it to be invested as a legacy in my son's name he rose laid some money on the table and sat down again the priest counted it it is a great deal of money said he it is half the price of my guard i sold it to-day the priest sat long in silence at last he asked but gently what do you propose to do now toward something better they sat there for a while toward with downcast eyes the priest with his eyes fixed on toward presently the priest said slowly and softly 
i think your son has at last brought you a true blessing yes i think so myself said tord looking up while two big tears coursed slowly down his cheeks end of the father by bjornstan of bjornson the fifty first dragon by haywood brown this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the fifty first dragon of all the pupils at the night school gawain le coeur hardy was among the least promising he was tall and sturdy but his instructors soon discovered that he lacked spirit he would hide in the woods when the jousting class was called although his companions and members of the faculty sought to appeal to his better nature by shouting to him to come out and break his neck like a man even when they told him that the lances were padded the horses no more than ponies and the field unusually soft for late autumn gawain refused to grow enthusiastic the headmaster and the assistant professor of pleasance were discussing the case one spring afternoon and the assistant professor could see no remedy but expulsion no said the headmaster as he looked out at the purple hills which ringed the school i think i'll train him to slay dragons he might be killed objected the assistant professor so he might replied the headmaster brightly but he added more soberly we must consider the greater good we are responsible for the formation of this lad's character are the dragons particularly bad this year interrupted the assistant professor this was characteristic he always seemed restive when the head of the school began to talk ethics and the ideals of the institution i've never known them worse replied the headmaster up in the hills to the south last week they killed a number of peasants two cows and a prize pig and if this dry spell holds there's no telling when they may start a forest fire simply by breathing around indiscriminately would any refund on the tuition fee be necessary in case of an accident to young Kerr hardy no the principal answered judiciously that's all covered in the contract but as a matter of fact he won't be killed before i send him up in the hills i'm going to give him a magic word that's a good idea said the professor sometimes they work wonders from that day on gawain specialized in dragons his course included both theory and practice in the morning there were long lectures on the history anatomy manners and customs of dragons gawain did not distinguish himself in these studies he had a marvellously versatile gift of forgetting things in the afternoon he showed to better advantage for then he would go down to the south meadow and practice with a battle-axe in this exercise he was truly impressive for he had enormous strength as well as speed and grace he even developed a deceptive display of ferocity old alumni say that it was a thrilling sight to see gawain charging across the field toward the dummy paper dragon which had been set up for his practice as he ran he would brandish his axe and shout a moraine on thee or some other vivid bit of campus slang it never took him more than one stroke to behead the dummy dragon gradually his task was made more difficult paper gave way to papier mache and finally to wood but even the toughest of these dummy dragons had no terrors for gawain one sweep of the axe always did the business there were those who said that when the practice was protracted until dusk and the dragons threw long fantastic shadows across the meadow gawain did not charge so impetuously nor shout so loudly it is possible there was malice in this charge at any rate the headmaster decided by the end of june that it was time for the test only the night before a dragon had come close to the school grounds and had eaten some of the lettuce from the garden the faculty decided that gawain was ready they gave him a diploma and a new battle-axe and the headmaster summoned him to a private conference sit down said the headmaster have a cigarette gawain hesitated oh i know it's against the rules said the headmaster but after all you have received your preliminary degree 
you are no longer a boy you are a man to-morrow you will go out into the world the great world of achievement gawain took a cigarette the headmaster offered him a match but he produced one of his own and began to puff away with a dexterity which quite amazed the principal here you have learned the theories of life continued the headmaster resuming the thread of his discourse but after all life is not a matter of theories life is a matter of facts it calls on the young and the old alike to face these facts even though they are hard and sometimes unpleasant your problem for example is to slay dragons they say that those dragons down in the south wood are five hundred feet long ventured gawain timorously stuff and nonsense said the headmaster the curate saw one last week from the top of arthur's hill the dragon was sunning himself down in the valley the curate didn't have an opportunity to look at him very long because he felt it was his duty to hurry back to make a report to me he said the monster or shall i say the big lizard wasn't an inch over two hundred feet but the size has nothing at all to do with it you'll find the big ones even easier than the little ones they're far slower on their feet and less aggressive i'm told besides before you go i'm going to equip you in such fashion that you need have no fear of all the dragons in the world i'd like an enchanted cap said gawain what's that answered the headmaster testily a cap to make me disappear explained gawain the headmaster laughed indulgently you mustn't believe all those old wives stories he said there isn't any such thing a cap to make you disappear indeed what would you do with it you haven't even appeared yet why my boy you could walk from here to london and nobody would so much as look at you you're nobody you couldn't be more invisible than that gawain seemed dangerously close to a relapse into his old habit of whimpering the headmaster reassured him don't worry i'll give you something much better than an enchanted cap i'm going to give you a magic word all you have to do is to repeat this magic charm once and no dragon can possibly harm a hair of your head you can cut off his head at your leisure he took a heavy book from the shelf behind his desk and began to run through it sometimes he said the charm is a whole phrase or even a sentence i might for instance give you to make the no that might not do i think a single word would be best for dragons a short word suggested gawain it can't be too short or it wouldn't be potent there isn't so much hurry as all that here's a splendid magic word rumplesnitz do you think you can learn that gawain tried and in an hour or so he seemed to have the word well in hand again and again he interrupted the lesson to inquire and if i say rumplesnitz the dragon can't possibly hurt me and always the headmaster replied if you only say rumplesnitz you are perfectly safe toward morning gawain seemed resigned to his career at daybreak the headmaster saw him to the edge of the forest and pointed him to the direction in which he should proceed about a mile away to the south a cloud of steam hovered over an open meadow in the woods and the headmaster assured gawain that under the steam he would find a dragon gawain went forward slowly he wondered whether it would be best to approach the dragon on the run as he did in his practice in the south meadow or to walk slowly toward him shouting rumplesnitz all the way the problem was decided for him no sooner had he come to the fringe of the meadow than the dragon spied him and began to charge it was a large dragon and yet it seemed decidedly aggressive in spite of the headmaster's statement to the contrary as the dragon charged it released huge clouds of hissing steam through his nostrils it was almost as if a gigantic teapot had gone mad the dragon came forward so fast and gawain was so frightened that he had time to say rumplesnitz only once as he said it he swung his battle-axe and off popped the head of the dragon gawain had to admit that it was even easier to kill a real dragon than a wooden one if only you said rumplesnitz gawain brought the ears home and a small section of the tail his schoolmates and the faculty made much of him but the headmaster wisely kept him from being spoiled by insisting that he go on with his work 
every clear day gawain rose at dawn and went out to kill dragons the headmaster kept him at home when it rained because he said the woods were damp and unhealthy at such times and that he didn't want the boy to run needless risks few good days passed in which gawain failed to get a dragon on one particularly fortunate day he killed three a husband and wife and a visiting relative gradually he developed a technique pupils who sometimes watched him from the hilltops a long way off said that he often allowed the dragon to come within a few feet before he said rumplesnitz he came to say it with a mocking sneer occasionally he did stunts once when an excursion party from london was watching him he went into action with his right hand tied behind his back the dragon's head came off just as easily as gawain's record of killings mounted higher the headmaster found it impossible to keep him completely in hand he fell into the habit of stealing out at night and engaging in long drinking bouts in the village tavern it was after such a debauch that he rose a little before dawn one fine august morning and started out after his fiftieth dragon his head was heavy and his mind sluggish he was heavy in other respects as well for he had adopted the somewhat vulgar practice of wearing his medals ribbons and all when he went out dragon hunting the decorations began on his chest and ran all the way down to his abdomen they must have weighed at least eight pounds gawain found a dragon in the same meadow where he had killed the first one it was a fair-sized dragon but evidently an old one its face was wrinkled and gawain thought he had never seen so hideous a countenance much to the lad's disgust the monster refused to charge and gawain was obliged to walk toward him he whistled as he went the dragon regarded him hopelessly but craftily of course it had heard of gawain even when the lad raised his battle-axe the dragon made no move it knew that there was no salvation in the quickest thrust of the head for it had been informed that this hunter was protected by an enchantment it merely waited hoping something would turn up gawain raised the battle-axe and suddenly lowered it again he had grown very pale and he trembled violently the dragon suspected a trick what's the matter it asked with false solicitude i've forgotten the magic word stammered gawain what a pity said the dragon so that was the secret it doesn't seem quite sporting to me all this magic stuff you know not cricket as we used to say when i was a little dragon but after all that's a matter of opinion gawain was so helpless with terror that the dragon's confidence rose immeasurably and it could not resist the temptation to show off a bit could i possibly be of any assistance it asked what's the first letter of the magic word it begins with an r said gawain weakly let's see mused the dragon that doesn't tell us much does it what sort of word is this is it an epithet do you think gawain could do no more than nod why of course exclaimed the dragon reactionary republican gawain shook his head well then said the dragon we better get down to business will you surrender with the suggestion of a compromise gawain mustered up enough courage to speak what will you do if i surrender he asked why i'll eat you said the dragon and if i don't surrender i'll eat you just the same then it doesn't make any difference does it moaned gawain it does to me said the dragon with a smile i'd rather you didn't surrender you'd taste much better if you didn't the dragon waited for a long time for gawain to ask why but the boy was too frightened to speak at last the dragon had to give the explanation without his cue line you see he said if you don't surrender you'll taste better because you'll die game this was an old and ancient trick of the dragon's by means of some such quip he was accustomed to paralyze his victims with laughter and then to destroy them gawain was sufficiently paralyzed as it was but laughter had no part in his helplessness with the last word of the joke the dragon drew back his head and struck in that second there flashed into the mind of gawain the magic word rumplesnitz but there was no time to say it there was time only to strike and without a word gawain met the onrush of the dragon with a full swing 
He put all his back and shoulders into it. The impact was terrific, and the head of the dragon flew away almost a hundred yards and landed in a thicket. Gawain did not remain frightened very long after the death of the dragon. His mood was one of wonder. He was enormously puzzled. He cut off the ears of the monster almost in a trance. Again and again he thought to himself, I didn't say Rumplesnitz. He was sure of that, and yet there was no question that he had killed the dragon. In fact, he had never killed one so utterly. Never before had he driven a head for anything like the same distance. Twenty-five yards was perhaps his previous record. All the way back to the night school, he kept rumbling about in his mind, seeking an explanation of what had occurred. He went to the headmaster immediately, and after closing the door, told him what had happened. "'I didn't say Rumplesnitz,' he explained with great earnestness. The headmaster laughed. "'I'm glad you found out,' he said. "'It makes you ever so much more of a hero. Don't you see that?' Now you know that it was you who killed all these dragons, and not that foolish little word, Rumplesnitz. Gawain frowned. Then it wasn't a magic word after all? he asked. Of course not, said the headmaster. You ought to be too old for such foolishness. There isn't any such thing as a magic word. But you told me it was magic, protested Gawain. You said it was magic, and now you say it isn't. It wasn't magic in a literal sense, answered the headmaster, but it was much more wonderful than that. The word gave you confidence. It took away your fears. If I hadn't told you that, you might have been killed the very first time. It was your battle-axe did the trick. Gawain surprised the headmaster by his attitude. He was obviously distressed by the explanation. He interrupted a long philosophic and ethical discourse by the headmaster with, if I hadn't a hit them all mighty hard and fast, any one of them might have crushed me like a... like a... He fumbled for a word. Eggshell, suggested the headmaster. Like a eggshell, assented Gawain, and he said it many times. All through the evening meal, people who sat near him heard him muttering, Like a eggshell, like a eggshell. The next day was clear, but Gawain did not get up at dawn. Indeed, it was almost noon when the headmaster found him cowering in bed, with the clothes pulled over his head. The principal called the assistant professor of Pleasance, and together they dragged the boy toward the forest. "'He'll be all right as soon as he gets a couple more dragons under his belt,' explained the headmaster. The assistant professor of Pleasance agreed. It would be a shame to stop such a fine run, he said. Why, counting that one yesterday, he's killed fifty dragons. They pushed the boy into a thicket above which hung a meagre cloud of steam. It was obviously quite a small dragon, but Gawain did not come back that night, or the next. In fact, he never came back. Some weeks afterward, brave spirits from the school explored the thicket, but they could find nothing to remind them of Gawain except the metal parts of his medals. Even the ribbons had been devoured. The headmaster and the assistant professor of Pleasance agreed that it would be just as well not to tell the school how Gawain had achieved his record, and still less how he came to die. They held that it might have a bad effect on school spirit. Accordingly, Gawain has lived in the memory of the school as its greatest hero. No visitor succeeds in leaving the building today without seeing a great shield which hangs on the wall of the dining hall. Fifty pairs of dragon's ears are mounted upon the shield, and underneath in gilt letters is Gawain Le Coeur Hardy, followed by the simple inscription, He killed fifty dragons. The record has never been equalled. End of The Fifty First Dragon by Hayward Brown Letter from St. Pro to Eloisa by Jean Jacques Rousseau. From Eloisa, or a series of original letters collected and published by J. J. Rousseau. Taken from the Monthly Review, Volume 25, 1761. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I enter with a secret horror on this vast desert, the world. 
whose confused prospect appears to me only as a frightful scene of solitude and silence in vain my soul endeavours to shake off the universal restraint it lies under it was a saying of a celebrated ancient that he was never less alone than when he was by himself for my part i am never alone but when i mix with the crowd and am neither with you nor with anybody else my heart would speak but it feels there is none to hear it is ready to answer but no one speaks anything that regards it i understand not the language of the country and nobody here understands mine yet i own that i am greatly caressed and that all the obliging offices of friendship and civility are readily offered to me this is the very thing of which i complain the officious zeal of thousands is ever on the wing to oblige me but i know not how to entertain immediately a friendship for men i have never seen before the honest feelings of humanity the plain and affected openness of a frank heart are expressed in a different manner from those false appearances of politeness and that external flattery which the customs of the world require i am not a little afraid that he who treats me at first sight as if i were a friend of twenty years standing if at the end of twenty years i should want his assistance will treat me as a stranger and when i see men lost in dissipation pretend to take so tender a part in the concerns of every one i readily presume they are interested for nobody but themselves there is however some truth in all this profession the french are naturally good-natured open hospitable and generous but they have a thousand modes of expression which are not to be too strictly understood a thousand apparent offers of kindness which they make only to be refused they are no more than the snares of politeness laid for rustic simplicity i never before heard such profusion of promises you may depend on my serving you command my credit my purse my house my equipage but if all this were sincere and literally taken there would not be a people upon earth less attached to property the community of possessions would be in a manner already established the rich always making offers and the poor accepting them both would naturally soon come upon a level and not the citizens of sparta itself could ever have been more upon an equality than would be the people of paris on the contrary there is not a place perhaps in the world where the fortunes of men are so unequal where are displayed at once the most sumptuous opulence and the most deplorable poverty this is surely sufficient to prove the insignificance of that apparent commiseration which every one here affects to have for the wants and sufferings of others and that tenderness of heart which in a moment contracts eternal friendship but if instead of attending to possessions so justly to be suspected and assurances so liable to deceive i desire information and would seek knowledge here is its most agreeable source one is immediately charmed with the good sense which is to be met with in company of the french not only among the learned but with men of all ranks and even among the women the turn of conversation is always easy and natural it is neither dull nor frivolous but learned without pedantry gay without noise polite without affectation gallant without being fulsome and jocose without immodesty their discourse is neither made up of dissertations nor epigrams they reason without argumentation and are witty without punning they artfully unite reason and vivacity maxims and rhapsodies and mix the most pointed satire and refined flattery with strictness of morals they talk about everything because every one has something to say they examine nothing to the bottom for fear of being tedious but propose matters in a cursory manner and treat them with rapidity every one gives his opinion and supports it in few words 
no one attacks with virulence that of another nor obstinately defends his own they discuss the point only for the sake of improvement and stop before it comes to a dispute every one improves every one amuses himself and they part all satisfied with each other even the philosopher himself carrying away something worthy his private meditation but after all what kind of knowledge do you think is to be gained from such agreeable conversation to form a just judgment of life and manners to make a right use of society to know at least the people with whom we converse there is nothing eloisa of all this all they teach is to please artfully the cause of falsehood to confound by their philosophy all the principles of virtue to throw a false collar by the help of sophistry on the passions and prejudices of mankind and to give a certain turn to error agreeable to the fashionable mode of thinking it is not necessary to know the characters of men but their interests to guess their sentiments on any occasion when a man talks on any subject he rather expresses the opinions of his garb or his fraternity than his own and will change them as often as he changes his situation and circumstances dress him up for instance by turns in the robe of a judge a peer and a divine and you shall hear him successfully stand up with the same zeal for the rights of people the despotism of the prince and the authority of the inquisition there is one kind of reason for the lawyer another for the officer of the revenue and a third for the soldier each of them can demonstrate the other two to be knaves a conclusion not very difficult to be drawn by all three thus men do not speak their own sentiments but those they would instil into others and the zeal which they affect is only the mask of interest you may imagine however that such persons as are unconnected and independent have at least a personal character and an opinion of their own not at all they are only different machines which never think for themselves but are set to going by springs you need only inform yourself of their company their clubs their friends the women they visit the authors they are acquainted with and you may immediately tell what will be their opinion of the next book that is published the next play that is acted the works of this and that writer they know nothing of or this or that system of which they have not one idea as ordinary clocks also are wound up to go but four and twenty hours so are these people under the necessity of going every evening into company to know what they are to think the next day hence it is that there is but a small number of both sexes who think for all the rest and for whom all the rest talk and act as every one considers his own particular interest and none of them that of the public and as the interests of individuals are always opposite there is among them a perpetual clashing of parties and cabals a continual ebb and flow of propositions and contrary opinions amidst which the most violent tempers agitated only by the rest seldom understand a word of the matter in dispute every club has its rules its opinions its principles which are nowhere else admitted an honest man at one house is a knave at the next door the good the bad the beautiful the ugly truth and even virtue itself have all only a limited and local existence whoever chooses a general acquaintance therefore and goes into different societies should be more pliable than alcibiades he should change his principles with his company new model his sentiments in a manner at every step and lay down his maxims by the rod he ought at every visit to leave his conscience if he has one at the door and take up with that 
belonging to the house as a new servant on his entrance puts on its livery which he leaves behind him when turned out and if he chooses it again takes up his own which serves him till he gets a new suit with a new place but what is still more extraordinary is that every one here is perpetually contradicting himself without being concerned at all about it they have one set of principles for conversation and another for their actions nor is anybody scandalized at their inconsistency it being generally agreed they should be very different it is not required of an author particularly of a moral writer that he should maintain in conversation what he advances in his works nor that he should put in practice what he inculcates his writings conversation and conduct are three things essentially different which he is not at all obliged to reconcile to each other in a word everything is absurd and yet nothing offends because absurdity is the fashion nay there is attached to this incongruity of principles and manners a fashionable air of which they are proud and which is frequently affected in fact although every one zealously preaches up the maxims of his profession he piques himself on the carriage and manners of another the attorney for instance assumes the martial air of a soldier and a petty clerk of the customs the supercilious deportment of a lord the bishop affects the gallantry of a fine gentleman the courtier the precision of a philosopher and the statesman the repartee and raillery of a wit even the plain mechanic who knows not how to put on the airs of any other profession dresses himself up in a suit of black on sundays in order to pass for a practitioner in the law the military gentlemen alone despising every other profession preserve without affectation the manners of their own which to say the truth is insufferable not that m de marot was in the wrong when he gave the preference to the conversation of a soldier but what might be true in his time is no longer so now the progress of literature has since improved conversation in general and as the gentlemen of the army despised such improvement in theirs that which used to be the best is at length become the worst hence it is that persons we talk to are not those with whom we converse their sentiments do not come from the heart their knowledge is not the acquisition of their own genius their conversation does not discover their thoughts and one perceives nothing of them but their figure thus a man in company here is nearly in the same situation as if he were spectator of a moving picture where he himself is the only figure capable of self-motion end of letter of saint pro to eloisa by jean jacques rousseau from eloisa or a series of original letters collected and published by j j rousseau taken from the monthly review volume twenty five seventeen sixty one the man in the passage by g k chesterton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Recording by Peter Tomlinson, London, 2017 The Man in the Passage by G. K. Chesterton Two men appeared simultaneously at the two ends of a sort of passage running along the side of the Apollo Theatre in the Adelphi. The evening daylight in the streets was large and luminous, opalescent and empty. The passage was comparatively long and dark, so each man could see the other as a mere black silhouette at the other end. Nevertheless, each man knew the other, even in that inky outline, for they were both men of striking appearance, and they hated each other. The covered passage opened at one end 
on one of the steep streets of the Adelphi, and at the other on a terrace overlooking the sunset-coloured river. One side of the passage was a blank wall, for the building it supported was an old, unsuccessful theatre restaurant, now shut up. The other side of the passage contained two doors, one at each end. Neither was what was commonly called the stage door. They were a sort of special and private stage doors, used by very special performers, and in this case by the star actor and actress in the Shakespearean performance of the day. Persons of that eminence often like to have such private exits and entrances for meeting friends or avoiding them. The two men in question were certainly two such friends, men who evidently knew the doors and counted on their opening, for each approached the door at the upper end with equal coolness and confidence. Not, however, with equal speed, but the man who walked fast was the man from the other end of the tunnel, so they both arrived before the secret stage door almost at the same instant. They saluted each other with civility and waited a moment before one of them, the sharper walker who seemed to have the shorter patience, knocked at the door. In this and everything else, each man was opposite and neither could be called inferior. As private persons, both were handsome, capable and popular. As public persons, both were in the first public rank. But everything about them, from their glory to their good looks, was of a diverse and incomparable kind. Sir Wilston Seymour was the kind of man whose importance is known to everybody who knows. The more you mix with the innermost ring in every polity or profession, the more often you met Sir Wilson Seymour. He was the one intelligent man on twenty unintelligent committees, on every sort of subject, from the reform of the Royal Academy to the project of bimetallism for Greater Britain. In the arts especially he was omnipotent. He was so unique that nobody could quite decide whether he was a great aristocrat who had taken up art, or a great artist whom the aristocrats had taken up. But you could not meet him for five minutes without realising that you had really been ruled by him all your life. His appearance was distinguished in exactly the same sense. It was at once conventional and unique. Fashion could have found no fault with his high silk hat, yet it was unlike anybody else's hat, a little higher perhaps, and adding something to his natural height. His tall, slender figure had a slight stoop, yet it looked the reverse of feeble. His hair was silver-grey, but he did not look old. It was worn longer than the common, yet it did not look effeminate. It was curly, but it did not look curled. His carefully pointed beard made him look more manly and militant than otherwise, as it does in those old admirals of Velasquez, with whose dark portraits his house was hung. His grey gloves were a shade bluer, his silver knob cane a shade longer than scores of such gloves and canes flapped and flourished about the theatres and the restaurants. The other man was not so tall, yet would have struck nobody as short, but merely as strong and handsome. His hair also was curly, but fair and cropped close to a strong, massive head, the sort of head you break a door with, as Chaucer said of the Millers. His military moustache and the carriage of his shoulders showed him a soldier, but he had a pair of those peculiar frank and piercing blue eyes which are more common in sailors. His face was somewhat square, his jaw was square, his shoulders were square, even his jacket was square. Indeed, in the wild school of caricature, then current, Mr. Max Beerbohm had represented him as a proposition in the fourth book of Euclid for he also was a public man, though with quite another sort of success. You did not have to be in the best society to have heard of Captain Cutler of the Siege of Hong Kong and the Great March across China. You could not get away from hearing of him wherever you were. His portrait was on every other postcard, his maps and battles in every other illustrated paper, songs in his honour in every other music hall turn or on every other barrel organ. His fame, though probably more temporary, was ten times more wide, popular and spontaneous than the other man's. In thousands of English homes he appeared enormous above England, like Nelson. 
yet he had infinitely less power in England than Sir Wilson Seymour. The door was opened to them by an aged servant or dresser, whose broken-down face and figure and black shabby coat and trousers contrasted queerly with the glittering interior of the great actress's dressing-room. It was fitted and filled with looking-glasses at every angle of refraction, so that they looked like the hundred facets of one huge diamond, if one could get inside a diamond. The other features of luxury, a few flowers, a few coloured cushions, a few scraps of stage costume, were multiplied by all the mirrors into the madness of the Arabian Nights, and danced and changed places perpetually as the shuffling attendant shifted a mirror outwards or shot one back against the wall. They both spoke to the dingy dresser by name, calling him Parkinson, and asking for the lady as Miss Aurora Rome. Parkinson said she was in the other room, but he would go and tell her. A shade crossed the brow of both visitors, for the other room was the private room of the great actor with whom Miss Aurora was performing, and she was of the Kai 